So, uh, Greg, thank you for coming on to the, the journey today, and Greg Powers, and um, uh, joining us for, now we just met a, a year ago, um, well, actually through um, when we did Artists Out of the Ashes, and I think you had contacted me right after that, mm -hmm. um, and, and told me told me a little bit about your story, but let me uh, just remind you and, and the audience about what is the journey about. Um, the journey is just having people like yourself, or ordinary people coming on to have a conversation about different things that have gone on in their life. Um, you know, not only the successes, but then also some of the setbacks, how they've had different things, either maybe with family, with with work, with career, um, with physical um, ailments. How have they, um, what have they done with those setbacks? What was the impact of those setbacks? But more importantly, what did they do to overcome them and move forward? And how did they fail forward and transform because of those uh, setbacks. So um, well, welcome again to the Thank journey. You. Thank you for having me. Yeah, not a problem. And so why don't we start off with uh, maybe just sharing a little bit about who you are, who you are, what, what you do, and okay. and uh, and um, and then also what do you do for fun? So let's, let's start with what do you do for fun? What If you were going to go and have some time off of work, I know you own your own business, but what do you uh, what do you do for fun? Well, I love to motorcycle. Okay. Um, pretty much motorcycle every weekend. Okay. Just maybe just local around the area or we'll go on like a weekend or a day trip um okay. love going to concerts sporting events okay um I'm, i love remodeling in the construction business so we okay. do a lot of work around the house okay um, we we've done a, we remodeled the house that we're in now we've put a pool in and a deck and a garage so okay. Okay. spend a lot of time as well working on projects at home so. okay so when you when you think about uh, a concert an outdoor concert or indoor concert whatever it may be what what type of uh, genre of music do you prefer country, country. okay right. <laughs> but we go to everything we're okay. going to be going to a kid rock concert here okay. next month but uh, mostly country concerts okay okay uh, have you done the country thunder have you gone up and done yeah, that we've okay. done country thunder and we'll go anywhere for concerts gotcha. okay okay all right so. my uh for me uh, my 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 wife originally got me um listen to country um, early in the 90s and like I was never like never listened to country because all I thought of country was like Oak Ridge Boys <laughs> and Charlie Rich and Statler Bros and all that because yeah. that's what my parents like growing up and then my wife introduced me to Garth Brooks and that time period of country and then my son got into it and so more of uh, more uh, of the last 15 years or so mm -hmm. and so, uh, so I think it's a lot more common now with the younger generation we went to a concert actually Saturday night at the State Fair and okay. Just lots of young kids. Yeah, yeah. It's not 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 everyone just with gray hair anymore. No. So. <laughs> so, so now you refer to we. Who who's who's we? Tracy, uh, my girlfriend. I've been dating her for five years now. And oh, okay. She loves music. <laughs> okay. So great. Um, we she loves motorcycling and concerts, and okay. we, so we spend a lot of time. Okay. Doing so both. Okay. Nice. Okay. Now, do you guys? Uh, do you guys have kids? Do you have kids together? Do you have? I have two kids um, from my previous marriage, and okay. uh, um, she has two kids as well. My okay. kids are 28 and 23, and hers are 24 and 18. So oh, okay. All right. Her daughter's just getting ready to go off to college uh, okay. here in a couple weeks, so okay. we'll be empty nesters. Okay. All right. Where's she going to school? Uh, Carbondale. Oh, so okay. Nice. Okay. SIU. Yeah, my brother graduated from there. Um, a while ago, but he, he graduated from Carbondale. He had a great, he really enjoyed being down there. So, Yeah, she's excited. Well, good. Good deal. So, you were talking about uh, or we were talking earlier that you have a business as well. Mm -hmm. And what do you what do you, what's your business? What do you do? Um, I've been in the plastics industry um, pretty much right out of high school. Okay. Um, I was a tool and die maker and then I got into sales and account management um, back in about 2000, 2001. And then in 2003, I started importing. I actually had left the company I was with as a sales guy and account manager. And um, 
Um, in 2003, I left and I <clears throat> basically was importing molds out of China. Okay. Um, and I had done that for two years and the shop that I was using to support and warranty those tools um, went out of business. So um, at that point, I had to make a decision. Do I quit the importing molds or do I buy the shop? It's it's very difficult to sell injection molds you know, offshore without having a local shop to support and warranty it. Sure. It's kind of like buying a foreign car and not having a shop locally that can work on it. Right, right. So in 05, um, I bought the shop that went, went out of business. Okay. So how old were you then at that time? I was 28. 28. That's a pretty big jump at 28. It was a huge jump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we, uh, I had like three weeks, four weeks to buy the shop. Okay. Um, they were basically going to close their doors in 30 days and, and I went to the bank and thankfully I knew some people on the board and they knew that, uh, you know, with a, I'd been in the industry and I had customer contacts and relationships and they supported me on it. And, um, I went to a friend who was also in the industry and was looking to, to be on his own. So him and I merged or bought it together as partners. And okay. then we, we were partners up till 2012 and he took his life shortly after that. Okay. And then, um, I've owned it since 2012 to, till April. I sold it in April. Oh, okay. okay. So I don't own it anymore. Oh, okay. Um, I sold it to a company out of Michigan. Okay. And uh, we can go through <laughs> why I sold it, but sure, uh, sure. it was a. Uh, so I owned it for 16, 17 years, something like okay. that. So. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, before we jump into jump into that, because that's always fascinating to me about that whole process of you know going through business and and going from a, a you know working and then taking that leap to be be an entrepreneur and be an owner and then owner operator mm -hmm. and then to a place where you've created something to be able to sell it. But let me ask you, Greg, are you from this Northern Illinois area? Yeah, I'm from Roscoe. Um, okay. I went to Hananiga. I okay. graduated from Hananiga and okay. I've lived in Roscoe my entire life. Gotcha. Still do. And uh, and you have siblings? Uh, now you have, you have uh, your, uh, tell, me, tell us a little bit about your family a, of origin. Uh, I have a brother um, who also passed away in 87. Um, and then I have a younger sister. Okay. Um, She's also from the Roscoe Rockton area. Is she still? Is she, so she still lives there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And unfortunately, uh, she's battling cancer right now. So. Is she? Okay. Okay. Yeah. But so. uh, yeah. Um, that's that's all I have left. So sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what what was it going in high school? So you you graduated in in the mid eighties, right? Um, from Hananiga. Graduated ninety. Ninety. Oh, nineteen ninety. Yeah. Okay. And then um, and, and so uh, what was it like in high school? What was, what was going? You went to Hananiga. So did you play sports? Were you involved with? Yeah, I other? played baseball. <clears throat> my f freshman, sophomore, and junior year, and then um, my mother was sick with cancer. Or so okay. um, I was kind of forced to be home and take care of her. So. Okay. And, and so, um, and again, uh, I apologize, the, the lineup of your siblings? So so it was my brother, would have. he was two years older than me, so he'd been 49, and then I was 40, 47, and yeah. then my sister's 45. Okay, gotcha. So you were the middle. And I'm then, in the middle. And so um, mom gets diagnosed with cancer, and what, what type of cancer was she diagnosed? No, it was uh, breast cancer, and then shortly after, um, and it turned into lymph node, and then bone okay. cancer. So. Okay. Okay. And and so you were. It was right around your junior year that that mom got the diagnosis, or was it going into? No, your senior? she was diagnosed my freshman year. Oh, your freshman year. Oh, and it just had progressed. And it gotten, had progressed, okay. and then so I think freshman year it was just breast cancer, and then it turned into lymph node. Maybe my junior year, and then. Maybe sophomore year, junior year, it was bone cancer, and then okay. senior year is when she passed away. Okay, okay. And 
and so uh, so t tell us a little bit. I know that you had mentioned before that there had been a lot of you know different types of setbacks, and you just mentioned the cancer piece, but that wasn't the only thing that it had uh, it had impacted your family. But that may have been the beginning. Mm -hmm. the, the cancer was the beginning. So mom was your mom was diagnosed with cancer your freshman year. Did she work outside the home prior to uh, being diagnosed? Yeah, she worked at a nursing home. Okay. Um, she worked third shift, so okay. she was pretty much gone at night. And okay, but you, but she was there during the day. She was there during the day, and okay. it was a uh, it was a long, rough road. <laughs> okay, for her. Yeah, um, meaning uh, once she was diagnosed with the cancer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Just uh, extremely sick from the chemo. Mm -hmm. Back then, I don't think they had the types of treatments they have today. Sure. So just the radiation and the chemo she went through just made her extremely sick. Yeah. 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 Okay. And weak and tired and. Okay. And when she was working at the nursing home prior to, obviously prior to the cancer getting bad, what, she was. Did she work with the residents or what was she doing? Yeah. The just a nurse's aide worked nurse. with the residents. Okay. So she was a caretaker. Yeah. And and a caregiver at the nursing home. And what did your dad do? My dad uh, worked for a printing company. I okay. uh, was a press operator. Okay. And uh, he'd worked there his entire life. So it's okay. the only job he ever had. Oh, really? Okay. And that was yeah. back before the digital printing. Yes. Was going on. That's so when printing shops existed. Yeah. And so, yeah, he worked um, at Thrift Ramps and Printing. Uh, I think he was there for 28 years. Okay. Something like that. Gotcha. And so mom gets diagnosed. And was that, from what you recall, and I know you're a freshman in high school, so it's it's harder. But was that one of the very first setbacks that your family itself had, yeah. had well, encountered? Uh, my mom had, like I had mentioned earlier, my mom had gotten diagnosed with cancer, and mm -hmm. and uh, that was in January, and. Um, my dad really struggled with it, and he spent a lot of time reading books and reading up on cancer, and and at that time they didn't have internet, so he spent a lot of time reading up on cancer, and basically, you know, he had it in his mind she wasn't going to live long, and uh, he got in depression mode. Okay. And... I never really understood depression, I guess, until I had seen witnessed it firsthand. But okay. his um, his body just shut down. Mm -hmm. like, uh, he, you know, he was a perfectionist. Went to work every day. Never missed work. Never called in. And he got to the point where he was just not going to work. He was calling in. He couldn't sleep at night. Um, his body just wasn't functioning. His legs were becoming paralyzed, and you know he had problems using the restroom, and mm. and so um, it was all just for my mother being sick. I mean, okay. So as you remember, I mean, because that I mean, I definitely have seen examples of how um, how when someone's is feeling powerless, right? They're mm -hmm. they're feeling stuck and powerless over. In this case, their wife, their their life partner, um, is struggling, and everything he was reading was probably piling on that powerlessness mm -hmm. and that and not being able to do anything. Um, and in in almost inevitably, his body almost did the same thing of what he was seeing, almost manifested what he was seeing, exactly. or was projecting what was going on with mom. Mm -hmm. So he. Um he got into a deep depression and he tried to take his life in I believe it was October of that same year which I can't remember if it was 86 or 87 but that would um, have been your freshman year yeah October your freshman year. and um, he tried it with carbon monoxide and unfortunately well fortunately he walked out of it okay. uh, but at that point it had already comatosed him okay. and so he spent seven eight months um and Swedish American okay. going through, you know, counseling and, sure. and um, I think it was the day after he had been released, he took his life as well. So mm. it was uh, that was all freshman, my freshman year, I believe. Okay, so mom's diagnosed with cancer in the winter, mm -hmm. and and then as dad was doing, looking into it and fearful about what was going to happen in a very short time period, his basically 
It was short. It was, it was nine short months, months, I believe. Okay, and so he, so he, so he not only was uh, in a very short time period. He then was hospitalized, and he was in a coma, and then he was in the hospital altogether, his psych hospital as well as mm -hmm. the physical hospital. Yeah. And then upon release that that fall winter, he he died. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was. Well, it was the day after he was released. Okay. And uh, I don't. At that point, doctors said that he he really didn't even probably know what he was doing. He was still, which I, I guess I was young at the time, so I didn't understand how it all went down. But if if he wasn't in the right state of mind, why did, was he released? Right. I don't know. I don't. It, it was so long ago, and I was young. But uh, yeah. long story short, is, is he took his life a day after he was released. Right. Okay. And the and and for you, so you're a freshman. Mom's sick. She's still obviously mm -hmm. going through the treatments of, of of cancer. And what was that like for for you? From what you remember of just well, I was I always stayed busy. I okay. I, I had a lot of great friends. I still do. And um, I just I always I always worked, stayed busy. I kept my I guess I kept my mind off it the best I could. And, okay. Um, I always credit my friends today to okay. who I. I am because okay. they were there when when I needed them. So sure, okay. So you leaned into your social support, your friends. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you were still doing the school thing, yeah. playing sports, doing, trying to be as normal as possible. Right? Correct. Yeah. And then you have an old, your older brother and younger sister at the same time. Correct. And and so um, now you're going into your sophomore year. Um, obviously, mom still has cancer and still going through the treatments of that. It hadn't progressed yet to the lymph lymph cancer yet but it it was still wasn't wasn't in remission correct and um, so what 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 was going on your sophomore year? so then sophomore year um, you know my my older brother and I weren't super close mm -hmm. um, we were close enough we you know did things together or whatever but from an emotional or I guess uh, sharing the difficulties we were going through and the mm -hmm. tough times we didn't really talk about it and um, at that point he was going through tough times as well um, you know he was he felt like he had to be the father of the family now because okay. he was the oldest and he was struggling with that and relationship issues and school issues and he was very um, very private person mm -hmm. kept everything in and he went and started going through his struggles okay and um, so I know that he had done some counseling at the time and um, to this day still don't know why but he ended up taking his life in okay. 88 so that would have been your sophomore year right my yeah. sophomore your year, sophomore year. Yeah. yeah okay and and we don't know why and, and many times even even like in your dad's case even though we can definitely say that 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 depression was part of it mm -hmm. we don't we don't know why there's there's always a multitude of complexities that play into um, why someone you know, there may be a tipping point, maybe an ending of a relationship, maybe the tipping point, mm -hmm. but there's usually a multitude of reasons that um, compound um, when someone's in that darkest part of the dark darkness. Right. You know, um, and so so part of it, a big part of it, was some relationship problems, but it also may have been um, him feeling the pressure of what was going on with the family and his role. And he was young. I mean, because right. how old was he when he died? He was seven. Seventeen. Um, yeah, he was very young, and, yeah. and my my mom felt that it was. She always felt that it was that he didn't have that relationship with our father like I did, and oh, okay. and that bothered him, and he struggled with that. And I feel it was a relationship issue, but okay. again, to this day, we no. don't know. Yeah, and you'll never never know. For no, sure. I'll never know. Sure. So, sure. so, so then we get into junior year. Okay. <laughs> And I had a very close friend, um, and uh, he was he was um, from another country and was dating a, 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 an American girl, and they had arranged marriages from the country he was from, and he was in love with this girl f that we went to school with and I was good friends with, and he was having his struggles with that, and uh, and again I I can't answer for what reason or why but 
my junior he took his life okay so I, it was my freshman year now my junior or sophomore year and junior year so okay. um I, again I, I we don't know why mm -hmm. i don't know that his family ever knew why mm -hmm. but uh i feel that it was he was in love with this girl and he wanted to be with her and it wasn't an option for him so sure sure but yeah. I, I don't know that it's yeah. just an assumption yeah and, and and maybe right that observation and again it's probably not as simple as that but it may be again that 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 position or perception of feeling powerless that i can't do anything about mm -hmm. this maybe like your dad felt yeah you know or your brother may have felt either because of the relationship or the lack or perception of the lack of relationship he had with your dad um Maybe it could be that could have been a contributing factor, right? right. That sense of powerlessness. Um, so that's your, that was your junior year, right? Correct. So, so you're 16, 17 years old. There's a, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> thinking, thinking it should be maybe things were simpler when you were in middle school, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> but um, so what? So you go into your senior year, and now it's just you, your sister, and your sick and your mom sick. Correct. And and, and now the cancer progressing and getting worse yes at that point um my senior year she had um she was bedridden um her bones had just deteriorated mm -hmm. and to the point where you know she couldn't walk or okay. couldn't move around so pretty much my whole senior year um she was bedridden okay. might even have been prior to that a little bit okay and uh <clears throat> At that point, my sister and I were pretty much taking care of her and my grandma, and then we had a neighbor that would kind of help out too. And um, so I think it was, I don't maybe February, March, she was getting really, really sick, and her whole dream was just to see me graduate. Okay. And uh, she didn't make it. Mm. What did, what month did she pass? Uh, April. Oh, pretty cool. Yeah, so it went quick. Yeah. Yeah. What I I can't even imagine, right? With the three losses that you had prior to that, and in watching what was going on with with Dad, but obviously he he was in the hospital, and there was a lot of things, crazy things going on, but. Mm -hmm. um, I know they can see there's a bunch of emotions yeah. coming. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay, Greg. <laughs> Take your time. You're good. So, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, um, obviously, you were close with mom, and you wanted, I mean, it wasn't like you knew she wasn't going to be able to get through this cancer, but there was a desire for, you know, uh, to be able to be there for graduation and, and the last activities yeah. of your senior year. But, um, Sorry. <laughs> that's, no, that's okay. That's okay. It's, you know, part, part of, um, of reliving some of these things, right, is, is also allowing ourselves a little bit more healing. And, and I think when we do share some, share those emotions, there's a, there is a, a piece of not only honoring, um, your mom and your dad and your brother and your, and your good friend, but it's also a way of honoring yourself. And there's like a cleansing that can happen. Mm -hmm. But for us guys, as a general rule, that's we don't do that. Right? <laughs> we don't. We right. don't. We don't do that because we want to just ignore it or whatever. But to to be able to be vulnerable, um, uh, I think there's a, a sense of strength that comes with that vulnerability as well. So, um, so l let me let me ask how. Um, you you do graduate, right? Yes. And um, and, and what what happened after graduation? Now the world's different, right? Because you know, and I can't imagine that now the house is different because. The, well, yeah, that was another crazy story. So, unfortunately, when my mom was going through her cancer stages, um, the insurance company that she had through work ended up going bankrupt. Oh. So during all this, she had no insurance okay and so basically the state took our house mm -hmm. you know to cover medical bills so okay. i think the house sat empty for 
probably two or three years. Okay. Um, obviously, I think of all the things that had happened there, it was yeah. probably a, a big part of that. But yeah. um, they ended up eventually selling the house, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, my sister and I didn't get anything out of it. But right. um, so we had went and lived with um, some good friends. Okay. Um, I lived there probably for about a year. And then my high school girlfriend at the time had gotten pregnant. Well, okay. <laughs> so I was 18 at that time. Okay. And uh, we ended up getting an apartment, okay. um, got married, and had two children. So okay. Okay. I think I had both my children by the time I was 23 or 22. Okay. okay. So okay. I don't know. Everyone says it happened for a reason. So. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so after high school, um, I got into the apprenticeship for okay. Tool and Die. Okay. Um, my ex-wife's neighbor at the time, um, he owned a tool shop, and he'd asked if I wanted to get into the apprenticeship program. Okay. And so I joined the apprenticeship program, and I had worked there for four years before moving on to another company. Okay. So I really, that's how I got started in the plastics tool and die industry. Okay, okay. Uh, what, what was um, your, your, well, I guess would now would be your ex-wife, right? Mm -hmm. what, what's her first name? Uh, Leslie. Leslie. And so you and Leslie started dating what year? Your, um, in high school, right? All through high school. Oh, all through, oh, so yeah. all four years of high school. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she was with you all four years in high school. Mm -hmm. And and then sometime upon graduation is when she got pregnant, mm -hmm. and then you guys moved move toward um, developing that relationship to the next next level yes so and I think you know I've, I've heard a lot of stories about you know couples who get together when they're in high school mm -hmm. and then for different reasons not always pregnancy but different reasons then later get married and and when we grow up together like that um, who we are well in this case who we are when we're 14 um, right. <laughs> you know and in the perception of the other person at 14 it's it's sometimes tough you know now we're 34 now we're you know and and as many things that that you guys experience just in just in your life alone let alone I imagine she had stuff in her in her life as well um, that's a pretty it's a, it's pretty amazing that you guys because you were married for how long 19 years 19 years and that in itself is a pretty amazing under those circumstances yeah this it's been a it's been a rough road yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know between all that and kids and yeah. and the divorce and mm -hmm. but everything like you said everything I guess happens for a reason yeah. it's made me who I am and yeah. a way stronger person than probably most yeah. well and I think about you know the you know the, the, all the different people that even the ones I mean and obviously a lot of ones that you didn't even mention came in during that time period when all this chaos was happening in your family mm -hmm. um, and in your household and then you um, and then and then because the insurance company <laughs> goes bankruptcy yeah. so it's like you're not getting a break anyway no. which way at the same time there was people that stepped up yes we had tons of wonderful people like just neighbors you know high school friends their mm -hmm. parents mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I will say that's, I still say it today, that's how I got through it, was yeah. just good people. Yeah, and even with the support of all these different good people, you know, you know sharing and, and, you know, giving a helping hand, then there was other opportunities and doors opened, and one of mm -hmm. them was um, through through that relationship and, and through her parents' neighbor that you got into the apprenticeship, which was another huge door that was available, but you still had to walk through it right and we talk about that a lot on the journey is that you know that may not that door may not have appeared if some of the hardships prior wouldn't have happened yeah I mean you wouldn't have been you wouldn't have been staying there right, right. I mean right. if if 
if your dad wouldn't have died, if your mom wouldn't have had cancer, or you know, in that, you know, right. and those different things wouldn't have happened, would that have door even been there? Right. I mean, it it, it may not have been, um, or if it was, you wouldn't have been there to see it. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, at least for me, I, I've always tried to get my head wrapped around when people say things happen for a reason, and, and I think that's been a saying, for, you know, for centuries. People will say that, but what does that actually mean? Things happen for a reason, and I think sometimes we can only see that afterwards. Right. You know, after the fact that we can go, okay, so that happened, so I could see that connect to this dot or connect to that dot. Um, but, you know, if we can somehow be mindful that when we're going through a hardship, that oh, how can I stick to who I am as a person right. and look for doors that are going to open? Because I can't even imagine getting getting the news that in the midst of all this stuff happening, then and then well, now the state's going to take her home. We don't we don't have we don't have insurance, um, and and that's pretty bad. <laughs> that's pretty tough. Yeah, it was. Um, but like you said, there was other people, other maybe some people. People call them angels, other things, coming in and stepping up and helping um, with friends. When you think back over that time period um, regarding yourself, right, what, what would be something that Greg, that had been consistent with Greg through high school, through those young adult years um, in this new relationship, not new relationship, but now the relationship's at a different level. Your role is different because now you're a young father. Yeah. Um, um, what, what would you what would you be a consistent something that you look back and go okay what was some lessons you learned about yourself during that time period or what was some something that may have pers persevered through that that's a tough one because uh, I don't know that I I think I coped with everything just by working okay um, my girlfriend now Tracy always said you you've never you've never I guess to say dealt with it or mm. coped with it okay. until now, because okay. um, I just worked. I didn't. I've never talked about it. Okay. Um, you know, even like friends and family have seen it and witnessed it and been around it, but I never, I never talked about it. Okay. And uh, I just, I guess the things that I did that were consistent was I was just with friends. I worked as, I worked a ton of hours. Mm. Um, I took care obviously I was married and had kids so mm -hmm. I was just trying to be as normal as everybody else okay. you know with working and day to day and raising okay. kids and you know we I probably had two or three new houses at, during you know my in my 20s so mm -hmm. um, I spent a lot of time with that mm -hmm. I don't know it's, it sounds crazy but I, I loved to work and I think sure. I loved to work because it kept my mind off everything yeah, yeah. well and it probably served more multiple factors, right? I mean, it keeps your mind off of things. If you're being productive, you're bringing revenue in, so you don't have to be in that same vulnerable space. That yes. You, so that you so know that happened when, you, you know, in, in your high school years. Um, because obviously the income coming in at that point was minimal to, to none, right? None, right. right. Yep. So, so there's multiple factors that working, and I think the, the term that they use, workaholic, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, it can serve multiple um, multiple facets. And, and it feeds itself, too. I mean, I, kn I know for me, it's kind of like either in athletics or in other types of things. The more that we do it, the better you become at it. Right. The more that you do it, you know, it, it, it kind of feeds itself. And um, when uh, when Tracy says that you've never dealt with it, what, is the, what does that mean to you? What, is, what does that mean to you? Well, I think she just means I've never grieved over it. Mm. I've never talked about it. Um, I've just always held it in, and mm. and 
she's probably right because until I met her, I never really did talk much about it. Okay. Um, even with like my ex-wife, um, she was around it. She had obviously experienced it, mm -hmm. witnessed it, and but she uh, she had never been through difficult and tough times in her life, so it was hard to communicate or talk to her about it because I don't think unless you've been through tough times that you quite understand the the difficulty of it. So, I mean, I didn't share in detail or I didn't talk about, you know, my struggles or dealing with any of it at the time with her. Right. I really haven't until just probably the last few years. And, okay. and I, I got to say when I was... Um, probably in my early 20s um, my ex-wife and I started a hair salon and uh, one of her clients was in there and she said uh, I don't remember this to this date she said you'll probably you'll it'll probably hit you the hardest in your 40s and I think she nailed it on the head okay <laughs> and it's I think it's more just because you know you see your friends with their parents and grandkids and I don't have that, and so yeah, yeah. it's uh, it, that's the part I struggle with probably the most now okay. than I ever have. But okay. the difference is now I can talk about it. Right, right, right. Or okay. in the past, I never talked about it. Right. Okay. And and I think that, you know, there's a combination of things that happen when when as we get older, right? Things start slowing down. The mm -hmm. the, the parts that we maybe were racing to survive and 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 not necessarily having the confidence that are we ever, are we going to be able to right. um, even do this some of that stuff settles down um, either one become, become more confident in what we do for a living or, or how we bring revenue in um, or we have an opportunity to build a business to a point where we can maybe sell it or mm -hmm. it, it can it has some momentum so it can live on its own a little bit but then there's a time and space where we can start being, you know, and then we start noticing, right? And we start realizing because busyness can be something like a drug, right? You, you know, it, it can, you know, regardless if that busyness is just piddling around, not doing anything, or through uh, through work or some type of ac activity, it can be just a distraction, and a day bleeds into a, a week, and a week into a month, and. Right. I think, you know, most people probably would have turned to alcohol or drugs or, or you know, at, at that point you're 16 years old or 17 years old and you have no parents. You can, you know, you can do what you want and mm -hmm. get into things you probably shouldn't. And yeah. one thing I'm, I guess, proud of myself for is I never did get into the drugs or drinking. Mm -hmm. And I guess, like you said, my addiction was work. Yeah. And, and I, again, not that work in itself is bad. It's that how do we use the work, right? Right, and I think sometimes when we and, and maybe use these phrases, I know I've used these phrases when it comes to work. Is I, you know, I have to, I can't, um, like taking time off, or I can't, mm -hmm. you know, do this, or I have to be there, or I have to see another client, or whatever it may be, and or I should. And these, I know those words for me are always key words that I know. All right, Kevin, what's going on here? You're you're probably out of balance. And I'm probably utilizing this activity or this thing as a way of serving more than what it is. It's a way of coping, a way of distracting myself. Right. So, um, so uh, what? Um, you, it sounds like there's a lot of things that have been different in your life in the last few years since you've been um, dating Tracy. And now, let me let me ask: Do you think that some of those things were already unfolding prior to her coming into your life? You've been divorced um, for how long prior to knowing Tracy? Um, probably two years. Okay, so there've been a two-year gap when you weren't you weren't at least weren't in a significant relationship. Yeah. Okay, and and so was there some changing already happened post divorce or? Um, no, I think it for me it probably changed knowing her, okay. being with her, just because she's been through tough times, difficult times. Okay. She lived on her own, had a child at a young age, and raised him on. Her. She did it on her own. Okay. Um, she lived on her own as a, you know. Was a young girl, okay. and so she 
she's been there. She knew what it was like. Mm -hmm. And just being able to talk one-on-one, face-to-face with her, she got it. She understood it. Okay. Um, I don't know. It's hard to explain. It's just she's probably the first person I ever opened up to. Right. And, and I think that's why. Just because I could talk to her and she understood it. Okay. She got it because she'd been there. Sure. I mean, she didn't have all the loss I've had. Right. She just had difficult, you know, difficult times and other, you know, other avenues. And, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I just felt comfortable. Right. You know, it's it's interesting. I'm going I'm to go back, um, you know, for a, a lot of different reasons. But I think of because never knowing who's listening, right? Mm-hmm. And and I and I think it's wonderful. I have my my brother-in-law and sister-in-law have been together since high school, and I know other couples that have been, you know, were were together in high school and and are now, you know, 40 years later, you know, or 50 years, whatever it may be and um, and it worked and they worked it and they worked it to make it work I think one of the one of the downsides though um, that can happen when we date young is that we get stuck we, we get stuck and I mentioned this earlier we get stuck in how we see the other person mm-hmm. and 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 you know when you're 13 14 years old 15 years old when you guys started dating um, you may not have been um, the most emotionally developed uh, young person like the rest of us teenage boys right, right, right. You know, but we get stuck there because not only with all the different losses and and chaos that was going on but then you also get stuck that way in in the di- the diet the the relationship as well of course you didn't want to have another loss right. so you guys stay together right and you continue staying together and she wanted to be there for you or however that was but we emotionally get stuck in the relationship may get older Older, and and dynamics may change, but we may not emotionally develop where when that relationship ends and we have an opportunity to do it with it with someone new mm-hmm. and they come in we we give ourselves and give that other person more of a chance than we would have given ourselves or our original person in the first relationship. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes no, sense. It does, but, yeah. And um and, and I because I don't know it's kind of like what you said about you know mom and the cancer and your dad and your brother and and the relationship issues. There doesn't have to be a bad guy to the story for us to understand the story, right? Because if we demonize someone, sometimes we're going to lose the opportunity to learn something from it. Mm-hmm. And um, and it, but when someone like uh, Tracy comes into your life, right, and she is has has a place where she's not going to be judging. She's open she's listening she's pulling mm-hmm. <laughs> she, because that's what happened with me I had I had you know when I met my wife the, you know, there was an element of the, that I, I wanted to be more than who I'd been in previous relationships but then I was also encouraged slash challenged to be more than I was so it was mm-hmm. that perfect the combination of both I wanted to be more I didn't want to be who I'd been but there was also with an with a person who could create that space, and then there was no. This is how I want also my life to be. Right. Well, he, when she was going through her tough time, she'd went through counseling where I had never been through any. Okay. Um, through all of that, I'd never went to see a counselor. I, I mean. I just, like I said, I dealt with it through work. And so when I got to be with Tracy or started dating Tracy, um, she had been through counseling. Mm-hmm. And so she had learned a ton from it. She, okay. um, she guess, uh, did her due diligence with all the homework and, mm-hmm. you know, the things that she was asked to do sure. during her counseling. And, you know, so when I would talk to her, it was like I felt like I was talking <laughs> to a counselor because sure. she she'd been there she'd done it she got it and um i don't know i was just very open sure okay so i want to go back to a little bit about a year ago right Mm -hmm. i had you know i started the shadow of silence uh almost four years ago now coming up on four years and um that that was the young adult um, suicide prevention program and a year ago or so um last september i was doing the out of the ashes event and it was where artists were coming together to talk about ways of preventing suicide and 
raising awareness about um, about what are the factors that lead to young adult suicide. And and not too that was in the beginning of September, and not not too long after that, I got a I got a, a message from you. And yeah, tell me what I, we never really talked about. How did that all come about? I mean, because for someone who doesn't, I mean, I'm thinking about just the fact that you're here talking about your story, <laughs> and and who you other than with Tracy, you haven't really shared much. But then you reached out and and wanted. But so what was? What well, I I'd, I think I'd seen the video or watched it, and um, I hear all, all, all the time. I hear you know so and so's going through drug problems or alcohol problems or their you know their significant other committed suicide or pass away you know from suicide, and mm -hmm. I hear all these people that struggle with it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone's been through four of them or five of them like I have been. So I just thought that I wanted to share my side or my story and what I did to deal with it because I think anybody and everybody can cope with it if mm -hmm. you know if they, I guess, go about it the right way. I don't, right. I don't know how to explain it, but um, I don't know. I just I felt it would be. I think it would be beneficial to share it. Sure. Share my side of it. Okay. Okay. Um, and, I'm, and I'm guessing you ran it by Tracy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she was supportive of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm sure if she could be here, she would be. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and I think, and I appreciate, so appreciate you sharing that out, what you did do with it. Number one, you were young, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you first started going through everything, and you, you like, you said you appreciated your your support system. You appreciate the friends, and then when opportunities were opening up, you took advantage of it. And and I think that is what I see sometimes. People um, we get we get stuck in our pain, mm -hmm. and we don't take advantage of of the doors that are opening, or we don't see even the doors that are in front of us that we can open up and walk through. And that you know I think the the big one that you did was with the apprenticeship. And in um, and, and walking through that door, which then opened up the next doors and the next doors from a career standpoint and, and, and a trade standpoint. Um, but at the same time, when we, anything done in excess, right, <laughs> done out of balance, yeah. can um, can have its own sense of problems, right? It, it, it can, and, and that's what happens when we put all our chips on to, the, to just working yeah. or, or just being busy. Your time, yeah, away from your family and your kids and, um, yeah, like you said, it creates a whole new other issues, but... Um, I don't know. It was the it, for me. It was the best way to yep. to, to cope with it and deal yep. with it. And it did lead to other opportunities. Like I said, we at one point I owned a hair salon, and then I got into the plastics industry, and yep. then I got into the construction industry, and yep. um, built homes. And I've always just tried to let one thing lead to another. And it it was it was everything to keep me busy, keep my yep. mind off things. Yep. And I think now that. Obviously, I'm with Tracy, who's been through tough times and uh, just recently sold my business um, in April. I'm probably as most relaxed I've been in my entire life. Okay. You know, I don't, I'm, I work eight, nine hours a day instead of 12 hours a day. And, okay. You know, I don't work Saturdays anymore, and I actually watch a little TV, which okay. I never used to do. Okay. So, yeah, my life's much slower paced now. Yeah. I don't know if you know, from this angle, when you said, well, I, I work eight to nine hours a day, you kind of said it as if like you're working part time. It's yeah. part time. <laughs> For me, it's part time. Sure. So, sure. And, okay. and I'm one that has to, and Tracy will tell you this, I have to keep my brain busy. And yeah. if I don't, I get bored and crabby and, yeah. and I like to be, to be busy. Maybe it doesn't necessarily need to be working anymore, but just working around the yard or mm -hmm. going places, doing things. Okay. So, so yeah, let's just touch base a little bit about that entrepreneurial part that, that there's a part of you that has been, um, not only did, you got into the trade, and that's how you originally started. Mm -hmm. um, and but there's been an entrepreneurial spirit about wanting not just to be busy, but to create things. Because to, to open up a, a hair salon, to go into the injection mold business, the plastics. I mean, mm -hmm. these are all creation. Go into building homes. These, this, there's a, an, a creative aspect of 
and then and then also this entrepreneurial piece. T- tell us a little bit about that piece. I think most of that started right out of high school. Just um, at the time, my mom was sick. Um, obviously, we didn't have. My dad had already passed, and um, unfortunately, he didn't have life insurance or much of a retirement plan. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was really kind of up to me to get my mom through her illness and help support the family. So I was I would did landscaping and people laughed, but I used to rototill gardens and I did whatever I could do to make money and I actually did very very well through all through high school. Okay. And so I had my own like landscaping business, I guess you could call it, and um, I did that probably for four or five years and then um, I got into the apprenticeship program and at the time I still dabbled in houses. Um, I I had just bought a new house when I was 19. Um, I did some work on that, and then I, I, when I sold that house, I general contracted a home when I was 22, and then um, I had very good luck with it. Good, it was a, it went very well, mm-hmm. and so then I did like one, two more years. Two years later, I did another one, and two years later, I did another one. Okay. So the that kind of just was a, the whole construction thing was kind of just a hobby that turned into a business. Okay. Okay. And then in 2003, four and five, I think we built like 15 homes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I was doing that at the same time I was importing the molds out of China. So I would do the construction during the day and the importing molds at night because China's 13 hours ahead of us. Right, right, right. Okay. So um, I don't know. It's kind of like just one thing led to another. And mm-hmm. I've, I've really only worked for two people my entire life. Um, Right now is the third com- third company I've ever worked for, and uh, there's a company that bought mine. And okay. I'm a head of sales for all their divisions. Um, they have seven divisions in the U.S., and then I still run PowerMark, which is my business. Okay. So it's just the the financial stress mm-hmm. of the business is gone. Right. And uh, that I don't miss. Sure. Right. Right. <laughs> um, which that occupied at the time probably you know 15 20 hours a week so right okay the amount of hours i work now even though i'm still managing that and i had a sales for five other companies i'm I still work much less than than what i was before so and and most importantly without that stress of the financial piece it was huge yeah <laughs> it's yeah. the i think i uh, I probably took about 20 years or added 20 years of life to me after yeah. that. Sure, sure. It was, uh, I, our industry, unfortunately, is very difficult because we're competing against China. Mm-hmm. Um, back when I started 16 years ago, you know, maybe 10% of the tools in the U.S. would go to China. Now probably 80 to 90% of them mm-hmm. go to China. And then all the experienced tool makers that were around in the 70s and 80s have all retired. So mm-hmm. finding good skills help is it doesn't exist (laughs) and so between the you know competing against China in the cash flow in our industry it's it's just so difficult right okay Um, it changed a lot and then as I had mentioned um, right actually I haven't mentioned yet but my partner he took his life in 2012 and um, so I've owned it from 2012 till now on my own and it just uh i had had enough of it <laughs> yeah you know understandable what in when your partner died did you i mean did you see that coming did you was, well he was going through some tough times with his family and okay. and uh 2011 we had lost a, a ton of money mm-hmm. um we were actually it was our biggest sales year but with the overtime and mistakes we we lost a ton of money Mm -hmm. and um he got uh, nervous, mm. so, so to speak, because we, you know we got the IRS breathing down your throat, mm-hmm. and customers, and or suppliers, and payroll, and just the overhead of running our business is phenomenal with the mm-hmm. equipment and sure. in the in the payroll alone. And um, 
he just came to me and said, Greg, I can't do this anymore. And mm. he said, uh, either we close the doors or you got to buy me out. And uh, I I bought him out oh, okay. in 2012. And I think it, was, it wasn't was much longer. A couple months after that, I got a phone call. They took his life. Oh, okay. So, he, so it was actually, it was after. Oh, okay. So you had already made that transaction. We had already made the transaction. Okay. So, you know, fortunately, I was able to get us completely out of that. Mm -hmm. That by like 2016, and uh, we actually did really well. Okay. 13, 14, 15, 16, and okay. 17 was another bad year. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said, I either need to sell this business, I need to find a partner, or I need to, you know, find an investor. Mm -hmm. I need to do something. And sure. I was again super, super fortunate and lucky that I found a buyer. Mm -hmm. Just because in our industry, there's tool shops going out of business every day. And yeah. Nobody's buying them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I kind of hit it off with this guy out of Michigan, and he came and visited, and we did a couple interviews, and mm -hmm. and he it took about eight months, but we put together a deal. And okay, it it's, it was a great fit for him. It was a great fit for me, and I don't have that financial stress anymore. So right, right, I mean, right. they're a huge company, so yeah, yeah. you it's, know, this is just like a little piece of the pie for them. Sure, right. It, what it does is it supports all their molding operations. Right, right, right. Okay, gotcha. So, right. it worked out. Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it was probably one of the best days of my life. Even though I loved owning the business and I still love running it. Yeah. It's just, uh, unless you've got some really deep pockets, it's just yeah. a difficult business to run. Yeah. You know, one of the questions I would love to get into, and I don't know, maybe we'll have to talk at another time. But what, what are your thoughts about? You, you talk about this idea of, of the skill, the individuals that are highly trained and skilled in machine operating and and, and that there's a lack now of that. What um, what's, what's the answer? What do you think is the answer to, because um, obviously the ones that have retired are retired. They're not coming, they're not going to be coming mm -hmm. back. And it sounds like, just by me just reading between the lines, that means there hasn't been as many coming up as the ones going out there's no one coming up unfortunately yeah. the only um, the only option in today's world is to do job training mm -hmm. like on the job training and mm -hmm. and we have three young kids now in there but we go through them like I mean 10 15 a year mm -hmm. and it's just you know they all want to come in and make the big money but don't want to go through the the learning process sure. you know to be a good tool maker die maker you, you need five to eight years of experience and mm -hmm. you know they don't have the maybe the patience level or you know the the wages don't justify it to them I I don't know I mean it's a it's a great industry um, all of our equipments CNC controlled so it's not like what people think where you go in you're running a dirty greasy oil mm -hmm. machine I mean our guys dresses no different than we do and, yeah. and um, it's a lot of programming it's a lot of computer knowledge mm -hmm. and it's a great industry and I've always wanted to start a school mm -hmm. just for machining mm -hmm. because our local schools and colleges and I mean, someone may correct me if I'm wrong but uh, it's mostly 2d machining mm -hmm. where everything in the plastics industry and what we do is 3d machining uh -huh. so we bring guys in that say they have CNC experience or they've got machining experience and they come in and they are clueless mm -hmm. I mean they've never done 3d machining mm -hmm. they might be experts at 2d but we put them in front of a computer in a machine and it's like starting it's like starting a high, mm -hmm. a high school route mm -hmm. because they don't they don't have the experience right well I imagine too the idea of recognizing like if if a, if a student was coming in and recognize that they're gonna have to spend the next six to eight years going through medical school to be to be that expert to be that doctor after mm -hmm. residency then they would recognize it's eight years you're gonna take it's gonna take to do this and maybe there's this idea this miss this myth that they're going to be an expert within two years. Right. Well, 
history says it's going to take six to eight years and and once you do then it's going to be a whole other level but i it's interesting so well, the difference is with versus going to like i guess college is here we pay for all their schooling we pay mm -hmm. for their books okay. and they work full-time okay so they kind of they get the education and the you know expertise at the same time sure so it works good for a young kid that's 22 23 yeah. maybe has a wife or girlfriend or they have a kid or whatever because he can still work full-time and still get educated yeah. at the same at the same time but I don't know it's it's definitely not something the schools I don't think are promoting in, mm -hmm. the, in the community colleges because we can't find nobody yeah I, mean, I, I at one point we had 22 23 employees then we went down to eight employees and now I think we're back up to 15 or 16 but our skill level is probably a quarter of what it was five years ago mm. so it takes us longer to get things done we have more mistakes um, the profit margins are much less and yeah. it's it's tough yeah interesting well I, I imagine now with a little bit more time and a little bit more mental capacity um, who knows maybe the next door that you're gonna walk through maybe it'll be something like that I would love to do yeah, it I would it yeah. would just I think if you could get a facility get you know maybe four instructors and and some you know a lot of these equipment people may donate the equipment just to promote the, mm -hmm. the education portion of it and I think it would go over personally I think it'd be very, go over really well if you set it up kind of like a, a college it's a mm -hmm. four-year deal and all you're gonna learn is 3d machining EDM portion and the wired portion and you'd learn everything you need to know about mold making sure but you know the struggle there is is what's the need going to be in five years because mm -hmm. right now everybody's going to China mm -hmm. so the shops that are surviving now are kind of like repair shops to China but mm -hmm. you know that could change tomorrow with the tax tariffs and right and everything else so I don't know it'd be interesting to see where it goes in the next five to ten years yeah. but I can tell you from when I started till now it's nothing like what it was sure well, you said a couple things today that I really hope that uh, you know for the people that are listening the ones that need to hear your story um, you know you you've used the word um, uh, you know that and I think it was probably being gracious you know that you've had some good luck right but but at at the same time then that would mean that you've also had bad luck mm -hmm. and and maybe it hasn't been luck at all maybe it has been life and life things have happened and and then you have chosen to continue putting one foot in front of the other and then one opportunities one doors were available you went through them and including buying buying a business Find your partner out um, with, with a new relationship with um, with Tracy that you decided to do that relationship different because the opportunity was different. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a combination, right? It's it's being persistent, working hard, and being persistent. But then, as as we evolve, as the doors open, um, or the doors present themselves, walking through those doors, not knowing for sure what it's going to be like. Uh, making a phone call to ask to be here today mm -hmm. um, to being vulnerable to being on the show and, and being and being vulnerable to as well as um, being vulnerable and in, in your relationship with her and your relationship with uh, your other significant others but um, Greg if you were gonna end uh, for with a last piece for anybody listening what, what would you want to want to share with anybody um, I guess my philosophy is is make smart cho you know make good choices work hard and you know always reach out to friends family like I've never been afraid to talk to my customers or my suppliers or my employees or my friends my family my girlfriend yeah. um, I don't know I think just being outgoing mm -hmm. is a is a huge thing because like like in my business partner and my brother they were very private and never held everything in and mm -hmm. and they struggled and yeah. so I try to be as open as I can as mm -hmm. social as I can yeah. I go to I keep busy I do uh, be productive yeah. nice um, 
I don't know, I'm just try to make good choices. <laughs> yeah. Well, Greg, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story, obviously, um, with the different losses that you've had and all the things that went along with those losses, leading up to those losses and afterwards and, and a combination of different things. I, I really appreciate you coming and, and sharing those stories and then sharing what you've done along the way with being able to um, see the doors and having the courage to walk through them. So, Greg, thank, thank you, you for, for being a, a part of it, and I look forward to hearing uh, uh, if you if you venture into uh, opening up a school. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Well, well, thank you again. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for being here today and, and listening to Greg's story as, as he talked about not only some of his loss and struggles as a young person, but then um, throughout his life and then what he did with those things, what he did with that loss, and then now where he's at with being able to open up and be vulnerable about what was going on, but most importantly, leaning on others. Thank you very much for being here today and look forward to being with you again next week.